Well, thanks for joining us online. We're currently working diligently to transition our online gatherings from being a pre-recorded experience to a live broadcast again. And we're in the process of updating existing equipment to make this possible. And our hope is to be back to a live gathering later this year. Now, as we work on this project, we've shifted our current online broadcast to include only the sermon. However, if you love to sing and you still want that to be a major part of your Sunday worship experience, we have a solution for you. In this season, you can visit ransom.online, where you will find a page with all the resources you need, including a link to share prayer requests on our prayer wall, information on how to take a next step in your involvement, as well as a curated playlist of worship that's led by our own Ransom worship team. Thank you for your patience as we make these changes. It couldn't be done without your generosity. Each week we hear countless stories of lives being set free by what God is doing through Ransom Church. And if you want to help with this impact, you can actually visit ransom.church slash give and find all the ways to support the ministries of Ransom Church. Thanks for joining us online and thank you for joining us in this journey of setting capitals free. Well, welcome. I am excited to dive into our newest series today. Uh, the name of the series is Wind and Fire. Now, if you fit into uh, the same categories I fit into as someone who was raised in church most of their life and someone who is becoming more, shall we call it, vintage uh, as a human being, uh, your mind probably goes back to a popular book written in the late 90s. And for my young, smart, and sarcastic friends here today, I'm referring to the 1990s, not the 1890s. I am not quite that old. Uh, I, I'm referring to the book written by Jim Cimbala called Fresh Wind and Fresh Fire. He wrote this book in 1997, and he tells the story of a powerful movement of the Holy Spirit in his church. And I love the subtitle of the book. Here's what it says. What happens when God's spirit invades the hearts of his people? What happens when God's spirit invades the heart of his people? A lot of people think this title for this message originated with Jim Cimbala and his book, but it, I gotta tell you, it goes a little further back than that. Like, turn with me to Acts chapter one. That's where we're at. Uh, if you're using one of our Bibles, we'll be on page 654. Ushers are coming around. You can grab a Bible from them, follow along. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, keep one. Uh, if you got your own Bible, turn uh, to Acts, uh, fifth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Uh, it is post-Easter now. And so we're gonna pick up the story of Jesus post-Easter as he prepares uh, his disciples and the church for what's going to come next. And what comes next catches the entire church off guard. And in a way, it tests the faith of every single believer. So I'm gonna make a bold proclamation to you today that not only summarizes what Jesus was proclaiming to the disciples, but that challenges the way that we think about Jesus altogether. You ready? Here we go. The world is better off without Jesus. Now, listen, before you determine that I'm officially off my rocker and, and ride me out of here on the rail, I'm not saying that the world would have been better if Jesus never came. Of course not. Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. He's the, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. The world needed Jesus and the world still desperately needs Jesus. So what am I saying with this bold proclamation? I'm saying that we needed Jesus after he died and resurrected. We needed Jesus to leave the earth because of what is leaving made possible for all of us. In fact, Jesus made the same claim about himself to his disciples. In John chapter 16, starting with verse five, we read this. But now I'm going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it's best for you that I do go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. So Jesus says to them, hey, it's best for you if I go away. You better believe the disciples did not agree. They were, they were not buying it. And to be honest, sometimes it's hard for me to buy into that logic. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can't tell you the number of times in my own faith I've said to myself, man, this faith thing would be so much easier if Jesus were here and I could just sort of like follow him around and follow his lead in life. But the disciples have walked with Jesus for three years 
every single day. They're convinced he's the Messiah who will deliver them. They're, they're ready for him to overthrow the Romans, to establish his kingdom here on earth. And now he's telling them he's leaving and it's for the best and they don't agree. And they're also asking, who in the world is this advocate? They, they don't know who he's talking about. This is a question I think believers are still struggling with today, by the way. Who is this advocate that Jesus is talking about here? Jesus refers to him by another name just a few verses later in verse 13. He says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Well, the disciples are confused and they let Jesus know about it. They said, Jesus, we don't know what you're talking about. Uh, well, time passes. They sort of forget about that conversation. And then Jesus is arrested and all their plans fall apart. They watch him crucified. Then he's raised from the dead. They're ready for him now. Oh, this is it. He's going to usher in his kingdom. And Jesus takes them back to the same conversation they were having in the book of John. And that brings us to our passage for today. Acts chapter one, starting with verse three. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So again, he's pointing them back to this advocate, this Holy Spirit. Uh, he appears to them a lot over this 40 days, and he spent all this time basically doing two things with his followers. First, proving he was actually alive. Second, talking about God's kingdom and about the Holy Spirit, the gift that God was going to give to us. He, he describes this gift as baptism. The picture uh, was that you got drenched with the Holy Spirit. Just as, just as uh, you know, in the symbol of baptism, we're submerged in water during baptism as a symbol that we're dying to our sins, being buried in our sins and being raised to new life in Christ. In the same way, he says, you're gonna be immersed just as deeply with God's Spirit. He's trying to prepare them for this transition from him to the Holy Spirit. And at the end of 40 days, Jesus actually does leave them, but he leaves his disciples with instructions and also with a ton of questions, biggest of which is, who is the Holy Spirit? Who, what is he talking about? So our goal in this series is to do our best to answer that question and to wrestle with what it means that the Spirit has come and why in the world it's better this way. Uh, and, and this gets us into a very tricky piece of theology known as the Trinity, there's no way to explain the biblical trinity to you. So what I'm going to do is just describe it to you. I'm not going to try to, to break it down and explain it. I'm going to try to describe it to you. So try means three. And trinity is the way that we try to describe the indescribable. Trinity is referring to how we have one God in three unique persons. One God and three unique persons. Now, again, I'm not gonna try to explain that, how that works, because the answer, I don't, I don't even know how that works, okay? But ultimately, it's outside of our ability to fully understand. But let me tell you why the Trinity has important truth about God, is an important truth about God. So we're created in God's image, right? We're meant to reflect him to the world. And one of the greatest reflections of God is his love. Scripture tells us that God is love a love that is defined within the context of relationships. So everything God wants to be reflected in our lives is something that's also true in his life. And love can only exist within the context of relationship. So what we have is a God who is in perfect relationship within the three persons of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Again, I'm not asking you to try to fully understand how that works. Now, most of us, we don't have a problem thinking about God the Father. When we think about God, we're usually thinking about God the Father. And we're usually pretty cool with his son, Jesus, who came to earth and died for our sins and all that good stuff. We can read about his life in the pages of scripture and we're like, okay, Jesus is cool. Uh, but the one most people struggle with and to get their brains fully around is the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. And as a kid, I remember the adults in church were always referring to him as the Holy Ghost which did not help my understanding or my anxiety about the Holy Spirit. Like I, and yet the Holy Spirit is not a ghost. The Holy Spirit's not a force. The Holy Spirit is not a lesser being 
or a messenger of God. The Holy Spirit is not an intangible thing like the force or a feeling. The Holy Spirit is God. He is the third person of the Trinity. He always has been, always will be. In fact, that creation in Genesis chapter one, verse two, we see the Holy Spirit involved with the Father and the Son in creation. In Genesis one, one and two, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So the Holy Spirit is this beautiful part of who God is. He's the power of God available to us, living in us. The the theme of this year is life in Christ. But the only reason life in Christ is even possible is because the Holy Spirit in us. Without him, we're powerless. And yet that's exactly what I think most people struggle with. Okay, Uh, before he died, uh, Pastor J. Vernon McGee spoke at the commencement at Dallas Theological Seminary. He was in his 80s at the time. And he commented to all these soon to be ministers and things like that. He said, if I could go back and do my ministry over again, the one thing I would do differently is preach more about the Holy Spirit because that is the great need of the church. They need a better understanding of the spirit who is meant to to guide us. And yet when you look at churches, what you find is that most Christians aren't comfortable with the Holy Spirit. Some of you are uncomfortable with the conversation we've had so far about the Holy Spirit. You're like, I don't understand any of this. And in a way, it's probably a good thing that we're not comfortable with them because he's God. Okay. But most Christians are worried, you know, if I lean into the spirit, everybody I know who's super spiritual is sort of a wacko, right? Like, People are worried if if I lean into the spirit, I'm gonna become a spiritual weirdo. We all know some people who like say and do really weird stuff and then they claim it was the Holy Spirit behind their crazy behavior. Uh, And then we worry if I get filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm gonna gonna be a bit unhinged. And so we don't want that. And we keep the spirit at arm's length, not realizing by doing so, we're actually keeping God at arm's length. So my goal is to take away your reasons to be afraid, or at least, very least, if you are still kind of nervous about it, that you'd be nervous for the right reasons and not the wrong ones. <coughs> Excuse me. So the Holy Spirit truly is an advocate given to us by God to help us live a naturally supernatural life, to set you apart to be who God made you to be. And the church desperately needs a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit, a fresh move of the Holy Spirit. I know his book is old, but I, I love how Jim Cibola put it in his book. He said, does anyone really think that America Day is lacking preachers, books, Bible translations, and neat doctrinal statements. What we really lack is the passion to call upon the Lord until he opens the heavens and shows himself powerful. In other words, what we really lack is a move of the Holy Spirit. In the coming weeks, we're gonna, we're gonna lean into the Spirit together. We're gonna talk about the supernatural gifts he has for you We're gonna talk about the supernatural battle we're facing every single day. We're gonna allow him to do some supernatural housekeeping in our souls. And and so if you're here today and you'd be honest with yourself and say, my my spiritual life's pretty stagnant, I'm gonna challenge you to really lean in. My prayer is that you would encounter the Holy Spirit in a fresh way in this series and that you would be filled with fresh wind and fresh fire. And for that to happen in you, it, it has to start in the same place it happened in the New Testament. Acts chapter one, verse four through five, Jesus told them this. He said, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promises. I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You see, change starts when we wait upon the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're gonna do in this series. We're gonna listen and we're gonna wait. If anyone here is desperate to be filled with fresh wind and fresh fire, let's let God do a transforming work in us through the Holy Spirit as we wait on his presence to move in our lives. In fact, Jesus goes on, he tells them this in verse eight, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's a profound statement, to the ends of the earth. Because at the time, Jesus himself has spent time in a small region and at the end of his ministry, after all the things fall away, he's got about 120 faithful followers. And now he's saying that when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they will be the one to carry his message and they'll carry it all the way to the ends of the earth. They'll actually do more than he could do in his lifetime. 
And as you read through the book of Acts, it's literally an outline of Jesus' promise. They minister to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 1 to 7. Uh, they carry the gospel to Judea and Samaria in Acts chapter 8 and 9. And by the time we get to the end of Acts chapter 28, the gospel is global. So this phrase, my, my witnesses, this is an important theme throughout Acts because God's plan for all of us is to be gospel carriers wherever we go. But it all has to start with waiting on the Spirit. So let's pick up the story in the waiting, Acts 2, page 654 in our Bibles. The disciples and the larger group of 120 are in Jerusalem. They're doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. They're waiting and waiting in my mind. Anybody hate to wait? Waiting in my mind is one of the hardest parts of our faith. I am often guilty of missing what God has for me. And more often than not, it has to do with my impatience. I can be guilty of getting ahead of God's will for my life. I can be guilty of deciding what God's will is for my life rather than taking time to discern where his spirit is leading. The disciples are often guilty of getting ahead of Jesus, but in this moment, we see the followers of Jesus waiting for the spirit. And we read this in Acts chapter two, verse one. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Now, I, I want to pause because I want you to see this picture. All the believers on the earth at the time fit into one room, a room smaller than this one. A handful of people in a room waiting on the outpouring of the Spirit, believing God's promise that when the Spirit came on them, they were going to be able to change the world. I wonder when you come into this room, and I wonder when we sit as a group of, of believers, do we actually believe that if the Spirit of God would move among us, that this room could actually change the world? Do we believe that this room could change the city? Do we even believe that, that it would change our neighborhood? It, it, instead of lamenting for the way the world is getting worse, what if instead we started praying for an outpouring of God's Spirit upon our church? Because something supernatural happens when believers gather and they pray and wait on the Lord together. And as they were waiting, the Spirit showed up. Verse 2. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Spirit gave them this ability. Now that right there might be why Christians are so afraid. Right? Imagine getting together with your small group this week and everyone grabs their snacks and they go to the living room for their lesson and you open up in prayer and everybody's house, you know, everybody bows their heads for prayer and all of a sudden the house starts shaking and a wind starts whipping around and the lights go out and fire appears floating in the middle of the room and then it separates into little flames and the little flames hover over everyone's head in the room and the people who usually avoid talking in the group, who usually avoid asking questions are now praising and worshiping God boldly in another language. That's a picture of the day of Pentecost. And we're gonna talk more about that throughout this series, but listen, here's what I want you to get your heads around. When the Holy Spirit comes with power in our lives, it's not just gonna interrupt our lives, it's going to invade them. This whole idea of having just enough of Jesus to get to heaven makes no sense from the perspective of the kingdom because God's will for your life is not that he would ride shotgun. He wants his Holy Spirit to take up residence in your life. And when the Holy Spirit shows up, it is a game changer. On the day of Pentecost, there was a wind and there was fire. In other words, they heard something and then they saw something and they received a supernatural filling that day. God's spirit fell on a room of ordinary Christians who were actually waiting on Jesus to keep his promise and waiting to cash in on Jesus' promise. Are you willing for your life to be shaken if it means that you'll actually experience a spiritual awakening and become who God made you to be? Now, I want you to notice this started with wind because the Holy Spirit is like the wind. Spirit in the Old Testament, is refer, the word is ruach, which means wind or breath. In the New Testament, it's pneuma in the Greek, which means wind or spirit. All through scripture, the Holy Spirit is described as a wind. Here, the literal translation of the passage is a violent wind filled the house. It blew through each heart, preparing them for what, what was to come. Now, what does that look like? What does the Holy Spirit look like? We don't know. 
Because wind's invisible. You can't see the wind, but you can hear when it's blowing. You can feel it on your skin. You can see its impact on things. Listen to Jesus' description of spirit. In John chapter 3, verse 8, it says, The wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Let me translate for us. You don't control the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit controls you. And that's why so many Christians are so afraid to surrender. That's why we try to settle for just enough of God because we don't want to let go of control. This is why we tend to keep faith at a safe distance in our lives because most people are control freaks. We want to control our whole lives. And that doesn't stop when we get to church. We don't like things we can't control or predict or manage. We don't like when it doesn't happen on my schedule, when it doesn't happen on my plan. But the Spirit of God doesn't care one bit for your plans. He does whatever he wants, wherever he wants, whenever he wants, in whomever he wants. And he does what is right and he does what is best, even if we don't like it. So when you come into a gathering and and you leave in tears and you don't know why, that was the Holy Spirit moving in this place and in your life. When you feel like the sermon is talking directly to you, that's not me, that's the Holy Spirit. When you feel conviction for something that you've done and suddenly now, like you have no peace about it, that's the Holy Spirit. We don't reject the Holy Spirit because of his power. We reject the influence of the Holy Spirit because of his unpredictability, because the wind blows wherever it pleases, and we don't like that. And because sometimes when it blows, the wind is a gentle breeze, and sometimes it feels pretty violent. Back in 2019, September 2019, Sioux Falls had a tornado. Uh, It didn't touch down for very long. It it, it traveled uh, a short path on 41st Street. It demolished the auto zone. It tore the roof off the Pizza Ranch. They were closed. Pizza Ranch was closed for over a year, rebuilding from what the wind did in about 10 seconds. Listen, sometimes when the Holy Spirit moves with fresh power in your life, it can uproot some things that have taken root in your life and it doesn't feel very good. Long-held addictions, unforgiveness, secret sins in your life can be ripped out by the roots. If you wanna know, am I filled with God's Holy Spirit? One test is, has anything been uprooted in your life? We need the wind of the Holy Spirit to blow blow through our hearts and replace fear with faith and anger with forgiveness and doubt with hope and judgment with grace and pride with humility and envy with kindness and cowardice with courage and impatience with patience and perseverance and harshness with compassion and selflessness or selfishness rather with generosity. We need the spirit to blow and to fill us with his peace that passes understanding. The Holy Spirit is the wind and we're desperate for him to blow on this church. And it doesn't end there. Number two, the Holy Spirit's like fire. Verse three, then what looked like flames or tongues of of fire appeared and settled on each of them and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Now we're gonna unpack that a little more at the end of the series. Today we're just focusing on what we can learn about the Holy Spirit, okay? Listen, if wind is about power, fire is about purity. And scripture describes God's presence, not just as fire, but as a refiner's fire, separating impure from pure. The the picture is uh, uh, of the day of Pentecost here is that one flame showed up and separated onto each of them as a picture of God's one spirit landing on each of them. And each of their spirits were completely under the control of the Holy Spirit, which means their words were his words. It means he put his words in their mouths. And I'm wondering if there might be some of us here right now who know that there are some things the Holy Spirit needs to purify in us, who could say, there are parts of my life that need a refiner's fire, but I'm too afraid. It just seems too painful. Paul warns us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, He says, do not quench the spirit. The picture of quenching here is to extinguish, to suppress, to stifle divine influence. I wonder how many of us here are guilty of quenching the Holy Spirit because we're too afraid of the pain of his refining fire. Christians are supposed to be set on fire by the Holy Spirit. Some Christians, not only are they not set on fire, they're stone cold to the Holy Spirit. Some churches, you look around, there's no fire, there's just ash. Just a pile of ash. 
There's no fire in worship. There's no fire in their prayer time. There's no fire in the pulpit. There's no sense of expectation. When I look at the church, often we see problems and splits and corruption and politics and what the, the church needs is men and women who are set on fire by the Holy Spirit. We don't need better anything. We need more of the Holy Spirit because when the Holy Spirit is present and the Holy Spirit is moving, there's wind and there's fire. So what does that look like practically in our lives? We've thrown around a lot of metaphors about wind and fire and as the series goes on, we're gonna dig more into some practicality, but what does this actually mean in my life? Well, Paul talks in Ephesians about being filled with all the fullness of God. What you need to understand is that whatever you are filled with, that's what's going to dominate your life. Let me give you some examples. If you're filled with rage, then rage will dominate your life. If you're filled with doubt, with fear, then doubt and fear will dominate your life. The goal is to be filled with God's spirit and allow the wind of his spirit to dominate my life, to blow through my life and allow his refiner's fire to, to transform me. So as we wrap up, I wanted to give you something to look for. Here are three keys, three key roles the Holy Spirit plays in our life so that when you feel these things, instead of leaning out, you can lean in to the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Holy Spirit convicts. The first encounter anyone has with the Holy Spirit tends to be when he convicts us of our sins. Since God is holy and we are us and therefore not holy, the presence of the Spirit in our lives often brings conviction. John 16, 8 tells us, and when he, the Spirit comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. Listen, conviction, conviction is not the same as shame or guilt. Satan makes us feel shame. Satan makes us feel guilty about what we've done and ashamed because of who he says we are. Satan says you are bad. You are your sin. Conviction doesn't do that. Conviction isn't the Holy Spirit making us feel bad. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit reminding us of the things that break God's heart. Now, I want my heart to break when I break God's heart. So the Holy Spirit conviction is a little bit like watching an inappropriate uh, movie or show with your mom. You ever watched a movie by yourself and thought it was hilarious and then you watch it with your mom and like your radar goes ding, like, oh, I didn't know they said that. That's conviction. You're being made aware of things where you were minimizing or rationalizing or justifying. And you're saying it's not that big a deal, but the Holy Spirit's saying it's a big deal. I wanna open your eyes to that area of your life. Listen, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which means he's with you at all times. So whatever you do, he is there with you to convict you, not to condemn you, but to remind you, to help you live the life God intended for you. Let the Spirit refine you and become who God made you to be. Number one, the Holy Spirit convicts. Number two, the Holy Spirit comforts. In verse 16 of John chapter 14, we read this, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Listen, whatever you're going through, the Holy Spirit is with you. If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit's with you. The word <coughs> Jesus uses is paraclete, which means to draw alongside. It's reminding us we're never alone. And Jesus says to us, hey, you're gonna have troubles, but I'm not leaving you alone. When you stand by the casket of a loved one, my spirit is your advocate. When you're signing those divorce papers, the Spirit is with you. When, when you're facing unemployment, the Holy Spirit is walking with you. When you go through that miscarriage or you're experiencing infertility, the Holy Spirit is there to tell you you're not alone. The Holy Spirit is right there in the middle of the mess and he can bring supernatural confidence. He can bring irrational peace. Literally, scripture describes it as a peace that passes understanding. Now I know the last few years were hard for everyone. They've been hard on all of us. And, and a lot of people lost a lot of things. And most of us lost hope. And where you've lost hope, the Holy Spirit wants to come in and bring comfort. Number three, the Holy Spirit counsels. The Holy Spirit counsels. A good counselor gives insight and wisdom on which way to go. So let's go back to our fire metaphor for a second. What does fire do besides burn? Well, it also illuminates, okay? So the Holy Spirit illuminates. He gives divine direction. Uh, he, he is the voice of God guiding you. 
If you're facing a life decision, you don't know which way to go. When you have those moments that you've done all the research, but you're never 100% sure making the right choice, it's at the crossroads of those moments in life that the Holy Spirit wants to guide you. Whether that be that college decision or the hard call with your business, or should I retire? Where should I serve? Where should I live? What should I do? What am I called to do next? What do I do after this major loss? The Holy Spirit wants to walk with you. John 14, 26 says, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I've told you. When I went to college, uh, I, I previewed a couple of colleges. One of the colleges I previewed was Oklahoma Wesleyan University, uh, where I now serve on the board uh, of that university. Uh, I went to the campus, it was a beautiful campus, but it was a little smaller school and I was like, nah, I'm not going here. This is this isn't what I want at all. I want, a, I want a big school. I want to meet a lot of people. I want to do all that. The next morning, God woke me up at about 5 a.m., which at that time in my life was unusual. Now it's every day, but it's, it was unusual then. And uh, I, I found myself wandering out to a bench that used to be by the pond there. And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me very clearly, this is my place for you. I said yes to that and my entire life changed because of the Spirit's counsel in that moment. My wife I met at that college, the kids I have because I married that wife, our adoption of Tucker, the planting of Ransom Church, in all things and everything the Spirit is whispering. And when he whispered to me in that moment, it changed everything. The Spirit is whispering to us right now, this is the way you should go if we will listen. So we're gonna continue throughout this series to listen and to lean in. My prayer for you though is encapsulated by these words from Jim Cimbala from his book. He said this, the old saying is true. If you have only the word, you dry up. If you have only the spirit, you blow up. But if you have both, you grow up. Father, I pray that you would bring us fresh wind and fresh fire. I pray that you would blow through our lives that you would uproot things that are not of you, that you would burn away what needs refining. Lead the way, God. We are here and we are waiting for your spirit. Amen. Amen. As we journey through this series, I pray that God would do a wonderful work in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit as he breathes fresh wind and fire into our lives. Thanks again for joining us today. Before you go, we've got some things coming up as we approach summer that we wanna highlight. First, our Summer Serve initiative. We have a couple ways you can serve. You can help with Summer Swap in our kids ministry where we provide an opportunity for you to serve which gives our regular teachers a break during the summer. For Summer Serve, we are also collecting gift cards in the lobby for Harbor families to share with the families that are hosting children. To find more information on these ways to serve, you can visit ransom.church forward slash serve. Second, signups for our kids, middle school, and high school camps are now happening. Registration for those camps closed in a couple months, so sign up by visiting ransom.events before time runs out and before spots fill up. Again, thank you for joining us today. We couldn't do this without your generosity, which changes countless lives. People who have been set free from sin, addictions, fears, and much more. If you want to join in supporting Ransom, you can find all the ways to give by visiting ransom.church forward slash give. Thanks for your support in setting captives free. I hope you have a great start to your week, and I hope to see you next weekend as we continue our series, Wind and Fire.